Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dee Cruz, and I'm the Vice President of Consumer Obsession at Cambia, and I'll be your MC today. It is an honor and inspiration to be among so many celebrated leaders and athletes, as well as rising stars, representing the change our world needs now more than ever. Cambia sponsors the Portland Classic and Women's Leadership Summit every year to inspire young women to reach their dreams and to embrace mentorship among generations. Our theme today is Beyond 2020, the new face of resilience. And what an appropriate theme for this year. Our speakers today and all of you watching with us today represent the face of resilience. And our program is focused on resilience through the generations. Before we transition to our speakers, I want to thank our sponsors for helping us bring this conversation to life today. Our first panel features trailblazers who define the sport of golf. Shirley Spork is one of the LPGA's founding members and one of the only women to be inducted not only into the LPGA Hall of Fame, but the PGA as well. Decorated with multiple wins and accolades, she, she shared her skills with up and coming generations, fighting to begin a teaching course for women who were learning to play golf. Shirley is joined by Judy Rankin, a sports commentator for ABC Sports and ESPN, and also an LPGA Hall of Fame editor for Golf for Women magazine. And with that brief introduction, I'll kick it over to Judy to share more on their experience trailblazing in the male-dominated sport of golf for so many years. Over to you, Judy. Uh, thank you, Dee. Um, it is really my pleasure um, to uh, kind of sit alongside Shirley Spork. Uh, one of the 13 founders of the LPGA Tour, and um, I'm just going to uh, see if I can't lead her in a way to give us uh, a little idea of how she got started in the game, and uh, we'll continue from there. But Shirley, it seems to me, knowing your story, that uh, the first thing you did in golf was you were a bit of an entrepreneur that um, had to do with selling golf balls in Detroit. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. Uh, what happened is our family moved from the inner city to the outskirts of Detroit, and the property happened to adjoin a golf course. I was 13 years old. That's a wonderful number, 13, because there are 13 founders, and I look back on the 13 of us founders. Uh, I was 13, and some golfers sliced their golf balls on our property. So I collected the golf balls, but along with it, I also picked some flowers. So when the golfers, the next ones come along the next week, I sold the golf balls back to golfers and gave them the flowers. So the boys in the neighborhood were caddies and uh, they could play free on Monday. And they said, if I had a golf club, I could play with them. So I took my money and I went downtown in Detroit trying to find a golf club for a dollar. And I went to a sporting goods shop and they had a barrel, but there wasn't any for a dollar. But he said, go to the SS Kres Kresge drugstore. They have some for a dollar. So I went there and in the barrel were long ones, short ones, shiny ones, wooden ones. I didn't know one from the other. So I picked up one that had a number 10 on it, and it was short and it was straight. So when I went back home and through the neighborhood, I said to the boys, I can go with you on Monday and play golf. I have a club. And they all laughed at me because the club was a putter. So I started with a putter, and there were two holes of golf right there, and I found some old tees, and I had lots of golf balls. And I teed it up and hit it down the fairway on the green, and then I came down the hill on the other side, and then they chased me off the golf course because I didn't have a ticket. It was a daily fee golf course. So I thought, well, what can I do? I, 
there was a big lot across the street. So I went over there and built my own golf hole. And it had my own golf course. So I was an architect at 13. And I dug a hole, made it pretend like a bunker. But uh, my first uh, instruction to the game came from the PGA having a free golf clinic sponsored by the Detroit Times newspaper. And for three weeks, once a week, they gave a golf lesson at a golf course that I rode my bicycle to called Redford. It's not there anymore, but it was a daily fee course. And the, 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 the professionals that came down the line as were hitting balls, uh, I had a big blister on my thumb and, and I said, how do I? And they said, oh, you have a bad grip and just kept walking along. So the second time, I, second week, I said, I, have, I was told I have a bad grip. And so finally, that was the first instruction I ever had is how- Let me you stop you there, the Shirley. Problem. Let me stop you there if I can, because I just want to remind uh, the people listening that this was all during wartime. This was during World War II. And um, uh, just so we get all of your story in, uh, let's move forward a little yes. bit to the fact that you went to a teacher's college um, to learn to teach. Um, I guess that was not necessarily golf, but uh, physical education. And, uh, but you soon found yourself interested in professional golf. And uh, quickly tell us a little story about um, what you learned about Babe. Well, a lot of people uh, in the 20th, she was in the first 50 years of the 20th century, she was the athlete of the 20th, the first 50 years. And Babe played all kinds of sports. And as a kid, I looked in the encyclopedia and she said she did all these things. And I thought, man, I could do one of those. So anyhow, Babe went on down the road. And in 1932, she won three medals in the Olympics. And after the Olympics, she was uh, disqualified in being an amateur because she had accepted money playing baseball. So she, she uh, was deemed a professional, a professional, not any sport, just a professional. So she had to re-qualify to become an amateur and she went to England and won the British amateur. Came back to this country, no competition. She signed, she convinced a sporting goods company to start a golf tour. And the golf tour was to start if they could get a manager. And so this gentleman got a, a charter in New York and brought it to Wichita and we signed it. And that's how the 11 of us, plus the two that signed it in New York became the LPGA. And so the LPGA started, but at that time I'm a teacher. I am teaching and coaching golf at Bowling Street, Bowling Green State University. So the very first tournaments that are organized were in Florida in the winter. So I taught school Monday to Thursday, got on a plane, went to Florida, played in the tournament, went back to school. That's not the way to play golf and play well, but that's the way I did it. And uh, after about three, four years on the tour, there still wasn't much money, but we did have manufacturers represented and we could give clinics and have an income. So we stayed with that phase of the game. And then I thought, you know, with my teaching credentials, we should start an LPGA teaching division. So each year we had one meeting and at this meeting, I was turned down the first year I tried, second year I tried, it was turned down and the third year it passed by one foot one vote in 1959. So that's how the LPGA teaching division got started. And now we have 1800 members. That's an amazing accomplishment. And um, it has meant a lot um, to women around the country. And I suppose in some cases around the world. Um, so you not only um, were involved in uh, the creation of both things, um, but you played pretty well, too. In 1962, you were second in the LPGA championship. 
Yes, in Las Vegas. That was great. Yeah. I almost got the wheelbarrow full of the silver dollars. Instead, Judy Kimball got it. <laughs> but uh, I always taught in the winter and played in the summer. I didn't have the financial backing to be able to be out there all the time. And I love teaching. And luckily, our very first golf tournament on the West Coast was played in Palm Springs area in 1953. And there were two golf courses here, Thunderbird and Tamarisk. And when we got through playing in the tournament, I went in the office and said, I would like to apply the job to teach here in the winter. And I have been here 67 years in our desert. And, and of course, I'm doing other things along the way, but this is my home territory. So Shirley um, really is quite a renowned teacher. Um, she was teacher of the year um, in 59 and in 1984. So uh, the teaching career has gone on for a very long time. She's the author of two books. Um, I think one about her life and one about um, teaching. But so Shirley, take these last minutes that we have. And, um, you know, when I think about the LPGA, I think resilience is a, is a great word to tie to the LPGA because time and time again, when it seemed, um, really very unreasonable. The LPGA has survived and thrived. And, um, you know, I consider us, you know, the most wonderful women's sports organization in the world. Uh, certainly we support an awful lot of uh, young women and women and even girls coming up in the game. So I wish you would take the last minutes that we have and talk about um, how, how you see and how you feel about uh, the game today and these players today and their extraordinary ability. Well, we're very fortunate to be involved full time in junior girls golf along with the USGA. Um, we started some years ago and it's built up and we, we now are in a phase of uh, increasing up to 39% and we want to get to 50-50 so we we're trying to get more people interested in our foundation and supporting junior golf. Um, it, it teaches so much to the individual, not just how to hit a golf ball. It teaches them respect for themselves and respect for others. And they learn rules and regulations and, and they make friendships. And those are the things that uh, Gosh, I didn't have any of those, did you, when we started? No, you know, there were so few, we were so few young girls playing. Right. There, were, there was no competition, absolutely no junior golf, and no high school golf in Detroit. Imagine that. And, and I was in high school, and there was no golf. They had one tournament a year at the city golf course, nine holes, and I won it, and I was the city champion. Whoopee. That was it. That was the only, and then I go to college and they're, they they defunct and they don't believe in individual sports. We're supposed to play intermediate sports. So when I went off to sneak a, a application side and I went and played the National Collegiate and won it and went back to school and was not honored. Uh, 67 years later, the school gave me my letter E and that's for effort. It took 67 years to get it. Well, it's a lot of effort. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was very fortunate to work with the National Golf Foundation, uh, teaching teachers and coaches how to teach the game of golf. And we had a committee who devised a teaching manual that, and we went, I personally did the West Coast. And in a seven year period, taught five-day uh, graduate course of, of how to teach golf. So the coaches uh, became efficient and able to present their subject rather than trying to do it and find out they couldn't without any knowledge. Um, the Golf Foundation is also very active in helping uh, 
and they're supported by all the manufacturers of golf. And our education division is terrific in that it's continued forward. Uh, along with that, uh, I look forward to seeing more and more uh, junior golfers continue on in their life in maybe in the sport of golf as not just players, but coming into a field of uh, design, invention, uh, sales, in media. There's all kinds of jobs available other than just learning and thinking you're gonna play on the tour. But today there are seven golf tours and we are very proud of the fact of our Symmetric Tour and now the LET Tour and the LPGA Tour all together. And I think that's a big, big plus for us, and especially in teaching. We can send our teachers over to Europe and begin to teach the junior program there and get more, more golfers involved. I think we all take pride in the fact that uh the LPGA over all these years has become a very global tour. And, um, and you know, the LPGA, uh, people can um, have an opinion about um, not everyone who plays and wins on the LPGA tour is, is an American, but it is a huge part of our strength. And um, uh, I give the LPGA all kinds of credit for being the tour that welcomes all comers who are good enough and um, as a result, now we have a connection with the LET tour in Europe. And um, I think what you're saying about all the opportunities in golf, finally, um, for women, for young women that you can get through college and so on, um, are tremendous. And um, you, are, you are such a, a shiny example um, for somebody who did it without any real opportunity. <laughs> well, uh, my teachers, at colleagues said, you know, you're going to go out there, and you're going to just try to make a living by hitting a golf ball. You stay here and teach school, you'll, you'll get retirement benefits. <laughs> and I said, well, I think I can, I, I think I can make it and I'll just save my money as, as I can. And I, I was very fortunate. No one gets ahead without help. And I had the support of people that saw this little redheaded girl trying to hit a golf ball and they believed in me and told me I could do it. And they helped me, uh, not financially, but they helped me uh, to, to believe in myself. And when I first started playing, there were the big three, Babe, Louise, and Patty. And there was not much money out there. There were only a few of us playing. And at the end of the, uh, the season and the end of a tournament, you didn't make enough to go to the next tournament, really, unless you had support some way. So you had to find a way, and I was able to find a way through uh, representing a golf manufacturer of golf craft, which was now a Christian Titleist. And, well, you know uh, how yeah. much we thank you. And, um, you know, I thank you. I'm another generation from you, another generation, a way generation from uh, some of these great players today. But um, uh, the, the road that um, you and just a few others paved um, for everybody and all the people along the way who have built um, this endeavor, this tour, this professional life to what it is today. Um, I think today's players let you know um, that they appreciate um, the effort from yourself and uh, the other people of that very first generation. It's amazing how well they can hit it today. And to think that one lady hit it in the hole three times in one yeah. round is unbelievable. And it was so pure, the shots she made. It even surprised her. She was That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Shirley, thank you so very much. I think our time is coming to a close, but it has been a pleasure to hear your stories. And um, I'm sure everyone um, involved um, it is, you know, it has piqued their interest about um, what a person can do. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And wow, Shirley and Judy, thank you for sharing 
uh, Shirley, your story, your golf journey uh, is one of resilience from changing your grip and playing with a putter, you know, at the age of 13 um, to winning the national championship and having to wait 67 years to being acknowledged and then not taking no for an answer several years in a row and establishing the LPGA teaching division in 1959. What an inspiration uh, for those of us on the phone. This Women's Leadership Summit is about resilience and about passing the baton and mentoring the next generation. And Shirley, your career is a beautiful example of that. So thank you for sharing the importance of help from others and certainly passing the baton as on as you have. Thanks for everything, Dee. This and was Judy, a pleasure. Thank you. And hello to everyone in Portland. Thank you, Judy. Bye-bye. Bye. Now we'll turn it over to the next part of today's um, summit. And I'd like to introduce Roberta Bowman. As the Chief Brand and Communications Officer for the LPGA, Roberta Bowman has significantly has significant responsibility overseeing all communications functions, brand, and marketing for the LPGA. A creative extraordinaire, Roberta spent 25 years at Duke Energy in Charlotte, North Carolina, in high-profile roles leading integrated uh, roles spanning public policy, environmental health and safety, corporate communications, and crisis management. She will lead our panel today of dynamic women who represent more than just excellence in golf, but resilience and achievement throughout life. Roberta, I'll hand it over to you to kick off the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much, Dee. And I really would like to exert uh, moderator privilege, if I would, and uh, mention two things. First, a moment to just appreciate what we just heard with Shirley and Judy Rankin. What an incredible gift it is to have access to these remarkable women. I can assure you that Shirley still has the commissioner on her speed dial. And of course, we are all so lucky to hear from Judy Rankin uh, every week in her role as an analyst for the Golf Channel. I also wanted to extend our thoughts and prayers to the good people in Portland, elsewhere in Oregon, and frankly, throughout the Pacific Northwest, to all of you that are dealing with these catastrophic fires. The LPJ has been coming to Portland now for 49 years, and uh, your home is one of our favorite stops on tour. All of us at the LPGA are sending our caring thoughts and uh, please, please be safe out there. So let's get to the panel. We are delighted to have with us today, Tiffany Joe and Stacy Lewis. Tiff, if you'd like to join us. Tiffany is in her ninth year on tour. She's a two-time winner of the USGA's Women's Amateur Public Links Championship. And she played her collegiate golf at UCLA. I have to tell you that Tiffany is one of the most multi-talented people that I know. In addition to playing professional golf, she is a surfer, a songwriter, singer, a punster. I'm not even sure that's a word, Tiff, but uh, also over the months when the tour was idled, she won the LPGA's World Golf E-Tour series. So Tiffany, delighted that you are with us today and welcome. And Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> you bet. And uh, joining us also, Stacy Lewis. Hey, Stacy. Hello. Stacy is now in her 11th year on the LPGA Tour. She has 13 wins to her credit, two of which are majors. Stacy is a proud Arkansas Razorback and one of the most decorated players on tour today. She's a former world number one, two-time Rolex player of the year, two-time Bar Trophy winner. She's also an Olympian, a wife, and a mother to an adorable almost two-year-old. Almost Chesney. two. Yes, so, almost. <laughs> delighted to have you both with us. You know, today's program is all about resilience. And as you heard from both Judy and Shirley, resilience is part of our DNA at the LPGA, but we call it something else. We call it drive on. Could we roll the tape, please? <laughs> Thank you. 
This is for every girl who's ever been laughed at or told she doesn't belong. This is for every girl who's been told she's too loud, too quiet, too this or too that. This is for every girl who thinks her body isn't good enough. This is for every girl who feels she doesn't fit in. This is for every girl who's been told that success and kindness are two different things. This is for every girl who's been told to give up. This is us crushing it for you. So you can crush it for the next girl. So every one of our players on the LPGA Tour has her own drive-on story of resilience and hard work and overcoming obstacles. And Tiffany and Stacy, you both have faced some challenges. You all have, both have your own drive-on stories. Uh, Tiffany, you had a, an important moment, uh, health care challenge in 2017. And Stacy, you've got a couple different chapters in your drive-on story. Uh, share with us uh, what those experiences were and in the spirit of resiliency, what did you learn about yourself in the process? So Tip, we'll start with you. Um, well, I love telling the story just because um, of how I find melanoma in 20 just because it's kind of one of those um, everything happens for a reason stories. And um, I was actually served by in San Diego and ran into a friend of mine in the parking lot and had invited to come to Baja on a road surf trip with me. And she had said, yeah, you know, I would love to, but I'm dealing with this melanoma thing on my leg and I'm going to have surgery again and I'm going to be out of the water for three to six months. And I remember as she told me this, had this, I had developed this weird nervous twitch where I would touch this spot on my scalp, this little raised spot on my scalp. And as she was telling me the story, I started stressed for her and I started touching that spot and listening to her story and all of a sudden made this connection. And I made an appointment with a dermatologist the very next day. And sure, a week later, it came back as positive for malignant melanoma. And um, to, at that point in my life, probably one of the hardest challenges that I've had to face. And, um, but, you know, for three or four months, I was able to get on tour. I was really lucky enough to find it early and have some great doctors and um, having surgery to have it removed. Yeah, I mean, I, I look back and I think, man, so many things had to go right for me to find that that particular day and run a particular friend. And I look back now and I'm just, I'm actually so grateful for that experience. We, we sure are as well. So what did you learn about yourself in that process? Right. Um, so it's interesting with, when I think about uh, like mental toughness and grit, you know, things that are really important for resilience, I always kind of think of the Rocky Balboa montage moment where people are just really serious and he's training and there's beads of sweat coming down his face. And, you know, for me, I've never, when I was younger, I thought maybe I just didn't have those qualities because I've always been quite lighthearted. I've always kind of found the humor in every situation. But now looking back, I learned that that's kind of its own type of mental toughness, right? Being able to laugh incredibly difficult, uncomfortable, scary situations. And um, I think back to the day that my doctor called me with my cancer diagnosis. And I remember um, she said something along the lines of, you know, we might have to shave a good portion of your head because it's in the spot where um, we're, we might have to do a skin graft or something. And I remember thinking, man, that look looked great on that, but I just don't know if I have her bone structure. And <laughs> the doctor, as she signed off was like, that was one of the most entertaining <laughs> cancer calls I've ever had to give. But I remember um, thinking like, maybe that's just the type of toughness that I have. Maybe that's my grit quality. And now that I realize, you know, that's resilience and grit and toughness isn't necessarily that stereotypical Rocky Balboa montage, right? Sometimes it's just making the best out of a really tough situation. Sometimes it's, um, coming to Portland and realizing that, you know, we might be able, we might not be able to get any practice rounds in, but the LPGA being able to pivot and opening up, you know, an indoor practice facility that you could sign up for time. Like to me, um, that's what it is. That's great. Um, toughness looks and carries itself differently with different people. I love that, that thought. 
Stacy to you, you had a couple of chapters. Um, I don't even know where to start, so I'll let you uh, pick up your story and what you'd like to yeah. share today. Well, I don't know. We don't probably don't have enough time for the entire story. Um, I think, you know, for me, I had scoliosis as a kid, for those that don't know, and I was diagnosed at 11 and um, was told I was going to wear, I think the biggest thing that, when I think of resilience is during that time frame. So I was told I was going to wear this back brace for two to three years and you wear it until you're done growing. And I didn't finish growing until I was almost 18 years old. So I ended up wearing the back brace for six and a half years. And so what you do is kind of after two years, every two to three months or three, probably three to four months, I would go to the doctor. He would say, we well, get x-rays, check it out. And he'd say, okay, three more months. Okay. Four more months. And this went on for four or five years. And at an age where, I mean, you don't, you're not built to deal with that kind of stuff. 13, 14 years old, you're dealing with how you look in your clothes and gossip at school and all that kind of stuff. And yet I'm having to deal with this disappointment every time I go to the doctor's office. And, and it, for me, it just, it made me the person that I am. You know, I, I just, I play better golf when my back's against the wall. I'm able to kind of bounce back from things and, um, and it's just, I don't know, it was, it, that is kind of the main part of the story for me. I mean, and then you can throw in, I finally stopped wearing that back brace and yet I still have to have surgery. I had done everything I was supposed to do for six and a half years. And now I still have to have a rod and five screws put in my back. And so I just was dealt with this adversity over and over again that, um, I guess you get pretty good with it and you just, you learn how to, how to move on and, and how to see the good in it. So I'm going to stay with you for a moment, Stacy, because we talked about your proud mom of a two-year-old beautiful mm -hmm. girl that we get to see out on tour, but you're a professional athlete and you make your living with your body and mm -hmm. childbirth is tough on people. How has that process worked for you and what have you learned from that process as well? Um, I learned that being pregnant is a whole lot easier than those eight weeks afterwards. Um, <laughs> I was able to play golf fine. Um, I felt really good when I was pregnant with her. And then um, the birth was hard. And um, man, my body felt awful afterwards. And, um, and so just getting back in shape and trying to do what we do every week and play so much golf and get your strength back. Um, breastfeeding and all the things that go with that. I, I couldn't keep, I know this, most women don't want to hear this, but I couldn't keep weight on. I was losing weight too fast, trying to take care of her, trying to play. And looking back, I came back and played three months after having Chesney. And I probably should have taken a little longer. Um, but man, she is, she's the greatest thing in the world. And um, she teaches you perspective. She's taught me a lot of patience, um, which has shown up in my golf game. Um, and, you know, I just, I love coming off the golf course and seeing her because she has no clue what today was, what it meant, um, or anything. She's just excited to see her mom. That's great. So you're both obviously professional athletes. Normal for you is to be in a new city, a new tournament every week. And then of course, everybody's world stopped with this pandemic. And my hunch is this has been the longest you've been at home for mm -hmm. a while, other than uh, giving birth to, to Chesney. What, what was the COVID pause like for you as professional athletes? And then we'll fast forward about how excited you are to be back to play. Um, well, Stacey. I'll say, yeah, I'll say for me, I loved it. Um, other than the fact that I wasn't making any money, <laughs> um, I loved it. I mean, as a, as a family, that was the most time we've had at home together. I think ever. So um, just to have that time and Chesney kind of got a normal life of being at home every, and kind of getting into a good routine, which has been harder since we've been back on the road. But um, I, you know, I enjoyed it because I had, I had time to gain some weight, time to work on my game that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So it, it's, the pandemic was really was great for me. I enjoyed being home um, with my family. And note to self, you're playing some spectacular golf <laughs> since we've been back too. So yeah, thank Tip you. Tiff, how was it for you? Um, I have to agree. It was actually pretty sneaky awesome. Um, I also had time to wait, but in a different way than Stacey. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, there's nothing like 
um, a pandemic and a lockdown to really help you put things in perspective and really peel back the things that really don't matter as much to you um, and really start investing your time and energy in things that are, you know, things like your family and um, your relationships with your friends. And it was actually really nice to get some time at home and really focus on um, kind of like rebuilding those relationships just because it, it's been so hard being on the road for the last nine years, just um, trying to have that consistency with that. But yeah, I mean, honestly, with uh, that, along with catching up on pretty much every one of my shows, it's, it's actually been really nice to have some downtime. Well, um, yes, but I will also say that I don't know that there was anyone else on the LPGA who won the off season like you did. I mean, every time I turned around, there was Tiffany on social media and you were making us laugh and having some lighthearted moments. But then you and a few others on tour did something pretty remarkable. And I just thought our viewers today would be interested in what you did with the Race for Unity and more importantly, the long-term effect that that will have. So tell folks what you, Morgan, and the rest of the, the gang did. So um, yeah, really interesting. And I have to give a lot of credit to Morgan because that woman is a doer. <laughs> she yes, just she gets is. things done. Um, and honestly, you know, speaking of pivoting in difficult circumstances, um, I'm sure you've heard of, you know, the public and a lot of us, right when gym started closing down, went ahead and purchased one so that we could still do some type of physical training um, during this extended time off. And it was interesting because we kind of formed a little group chat, a lot of the LPGA girls, and we started kind of commenting or messaging each other whenever one of us wanted to, to do a ride with each other. And Morgan kind of floated this idea of doing this gnarly 10, 10 minute, like, marathon ride and I said absolutely not but I would do it if it was for a charity and so that kind of really kind of blossomed really quickly into the race for unity and I mean I think we ended up throwing it all together in maybe four days um again a lot of credit to Morgan Fressel <laughs> because she is just an amazing person to have at the helm of that and um yeah and you know at the time a lot of us were struggling with you know, what can we do um, to address like racial inequality? A lot of us, we're still trying to listen and learn from our friends and um, try to figure out um, how we could help and how we could use our platform to, to just help the cause. And um, yeah, we ended up putting, I think it was me, Jihae Lee, uh, Henny, now Koyak, and um, Morgan. And we ended up just throwing this together. And it was so awesome to get to go to Toledo yeah. and, you know, be able to start like seeing the fruition of our work. I mean, how often do you get to put an event together literally a month later, get to see what, what it's done and um, just seeing the, the Renee Powell um, being promoted that week, I, I was just so excited. You, you should be excited and proud uh, for folks that are just picking up on that. The Renee Powell grant was initiated by these players through the ride, and its focus is to bring more Black girls into our renowned girls golf program, Tiffany, that you are an ambassador of, and just bring the game of golf to those that are typically underrepresented in the sport. So uh, I have to say it was a brilliant idea and the LPGA is committed to growing it and again, changing the face of golf. So uh, congratulations to you. By the way, if anybody's watching, never ever accept a challenge from Morgan Pressel on a Peloton. You will die in the process. So anyway, uh, let's come back to Portland, Stacey. Uh, yep. Portland is really pretty special to you. Uh, 2017, uh, you'd been playing for a while. It was a tough time in the world. Just share with us what happened then and, and your favorite memories from that week. Yeah, so... Um... About that time, the week prior, we were in Canada, and um, Hurricane Harvey was hitting Houston, and my husband was there, my parents were there, um, you know, of course, I'm worried about them, and the following week, we come to Portland, and I'm just distracted, you know, I, 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 why am I here, you know, everybody's at home, they're struggling, they're, you know, roads are flooded, everything's bad, and 
I just needed a focus for the week. And so I just told my husband, on, I was talking to him, I think it was on Tuesday night. I said, whatever I win this week, I'm going to donate to the relief. And he's like, that's awesome. And that was the extent that we talked about it. And that was it. It was more to just give myself a focus. And, um, and I, this was a stretch of, I don't know how many second place finishes I had had, but it had been a couple of years since I had won, um, been runner up a ton, a tons of disappointments. And Solheim Cup prior to that was probably one of the lowest points for me personally I'd ever had on the golf course. And so to come out of that a couple of weeks later and things just started, cuts started to go in, things just started happening the way they needed to. And I win by a couple, I think it was one or two shots on Sunday. So it was, this place is always going to be so special to me. And again, not only your generosity, but I remember seeing you with some of the rebuilding efforts and mm -hmm. much like Tiff was talking about seeing the money go to, go to work. I think I really saw the way you and your husband um, made this, this particular challenge your own and made a huge difference. So thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Tiffany, we did have a question before we get to the next one. They want to know what your Peloton leaderboard name is. So it is follow treat you now. Jo <laughs> it is treat Joe self. The Joe is J O H. <laughs> but please do not judge me for my numbers or the lack of my writing in the last six weeks. Well, it that's hasn't great. Been good. <laughs> that's great. So we've got folks uh, maybe experiencing the LPJ for the first time because of today's uh, Women's Leadership Summit. Some that are long-term fans, but. For folks that are new to the LPGA, uh, the, gosh, there's so much to talk about. What's one thing you would lift out to them uh, if they're just experiencing the LPGA for the first time? Tiff, I've got you on the, on the board, so you start. Um, I want to say just the, the variety of personalities on our tour. Um, obviously, it's very diverse, um, not just in terms of how girls look, but I mean, in terms of just who they are as people. And, you know, I, I'm always blown away. I mean, every, any given week, there's 140 plus players. So it's actually really hard, even throughout the duration of nine years on tour to really get to know everyone that well. But, you know, every time I get paired up and around with someone that I don't know as well, I mean, it's just, there's always an opportunity to be exposed to just some amazing people. And, you know, I even think back to, this pandemic and putting together the race for unity with Morgan Pressel. And I mean, in nine years on tour, I, I knew Morgan pretty well and even growing up with her in junior golf and everything. But I mean, I did not know her to the, as well as I did after we had organized that event together. Like I had no idea that she was such, I think we started calling her the hurricane of excellence because <laughs> you give her a task and she just got it done. And, and, you know, um, and the same thing happened at, I had some issues with my flights going to and from the British, uh, the Scotland this year. And um, I just remember I, one of my flights had been canceled and I just saw Morgan in the terminal and I was like, Morgan, help me. And she just was on the phone with American Airlines and she had me on like an, another flight. And I was like, that's why we called her that. That's why she's the hurricane of excellence. And I think that's just a testament to just all the variety of personalities we have on our tour. That's great. Stacy. how about you? I think we're darn good golfers and I don't think a lot of the girls on our tour get that res enough respect for that. Um, I was actually watching some of the U S open tennis and thinking to myself, man, just how much better women's tennis has gotten over the years. And we can say the same thing about our sport. Um, you look at the scores that were shot last week at ANA, um, go watch Lexi Thompson hit a golf ball. It is unbelievable. There is no other female that hits it like she does. Um, you know, Nellie Corda bombs it, hits it so straight. Same with Brooke Henderson. I mean, it's, it's so impressive, the golf that is played now versus when I played, when I came on tour, I mean, I'd say 10, 11 years ago, there were probably 30 players that could really could probably win on a given week. And I think now you could go, go down to 70 or 80. Um, I just, I just think golf is, it's so, our women's golf is so good. And I just want people to watch it. Yeah. No, and I, you've said that to me consistently. You know I've drafted you over your career, learned something from you every time we talk. Uh, but let's, let's shift gears to our, our final question today is going to deal with sponsorships. And just a data point for folks that are watching today. Of the $40 billion that corporations invested in sports sponsorships last year, 93% 
went to men's sports. Said another way, of every dollar corporations invested in sports sponsorships, more than 93% directed to men's sports. We have an incredible sponsor here in Cambia and the others this week, but just as our final comment today, Stacy, Tip, you've seen the, the tour. What do sponsors, first of all, mean to the LPGA and second to you personally? I think for the tours, I mean, as you can see, I mean, sponsors are everything for us. Um, most every tournament we play has a sponsor's name on it. And um, we're so thankful for the 7% that we do have. Um, and we have to continue to push the barriers because that number is, it's so disappointing when you think about it across the board. Um, it's, it's hard, I, you know, if I was a female on a board of a company, how do you justify, you know, spending four to five times as much on a PJ tour event and not supporting the women. You know, I just, I just, I would love to be in a boardroom and know how you justify that. And, you know, we're making strides. There's a lot in the, in the business world going on with women and women's summits and initiatives like, like what we're doing today. And um, so, which is a good thing for our tour in general. So we just need to continue to push the, push the envelope, but also, never forget to thank the ones we do have right now and the ones that are starting this moment, this movement um, that have helped us get to where we are now. Absolutely. And I'll just pause and ask you to just share with everybody one of our favorite sponsors is Smuckers. And would you tell everybody why? Yes, Smuckers uh, sponsors our daycare program. And, um, you know, they, all they require of us is a pro-am, which is outrageous to me because the cost of if I had to have a nanny travel with me every week and help with Chesney or a parent or whatever it is, I couldn't do it. So um, it, it's a pretty fitting sponsor that we have and uh, we get all the Uncrustables that we need for the kids. And um, you know, they, they have such a great time and Chesney's already, de her development has so advanced just getting that teaching um, every day really. Not only do they provide this, but to me, it's astonishing. They've done this for 25 years now before uh, corporate sponsor daycare was, was a thing. So right. Tiffany, what about you? What is, when you think of sponsors um, and their importance? Yeah, I mean, sponsors are everything. To go back, Smuckers is also the sponsor of Tip Joe's Lunch Pail Box. Um, but yeah, you know, sponsors are everything and it's more than just the financial part. It's, it's just support, you know, and we're so thankful, like Stacey said, for that 7%. And, and, you know, to be honest, like this is women's golf is the future and the tide is changing. And I think I remember, um, hearing that young girls are one of the fastest growing demographics in golf and, you know, throughout all the demographics. And I think, I think that's just so exciting. And I think, the ones that are supporting women's golf now knows that that's where the game is headed. So, I mean, I think it's so important, not just within the scope of golf, but I think within the scope of everything. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, and thank you for that. Well, just to wrap up, I've got one last comment to make, and that is, uh, as we've heard, the LPGA has had some pretty remarkable allies and advocates over our history. And among them have been Mark Gans, who's been Cambia's long serving CEO. Uh, I remember Mark saying that to him, the LPGA is about so much more than superb golf. He said, investing in the LPGA is a celebration of women's achievement and empowerment. And indeed, that's why we have these conversations at most of our events. Mark has recently shared his plans to retire at the end of this year. Um, and I think just on behalf of Shirley and Judy and Tiff and Stacy and Cheyenne, and really every other woman who dreams of taking her talent to the highest of stages, we wanted to thank Mark, and the entire Cambia team for investing in both the power and the potential of women. So with that, my friends, drive on. D to you. What a great conversation. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you, Stacy, And thank you, Tiffany. Roberta, you moderated such a rich discussion. Um, and Stacy and Tiffany, your stories uh, of resilience and your own personal health journeys and how you've invested 
in, into the community uh, and are giving back are truly inspirational. So thank you very much. For the last part of today's summit, it's my honor to shift our focus uh, to the winners of our teen essay challenge on racial justice. As I prepared remarks today to introduce them, I thought about a quote uh, from Martin Luther King. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And this generation and the generation that came before us that we've had the honor of hearing from today remind us of that. So we're so thankful that they shared their voices with us and the two teen winners shared their vision of the future with us. So with that, and to help introduce them, I'd love to welcome our next guest. Today I'm joined by Cheyenne Woods, a respected and recognized athlete. And like many of our speakers today, she's changing the game, not just in golf, but also using her voice to call out racism and inequality. Hi, Dee. Hello, Cheyenne. Hey. Happy to have you here. Yes, thank you. Thank you so um, much. So Cheyenne, before we transition to our essay winners, I wanted to ask you just a few questions. Um, can you share a little bit more about what drove you to be involved in the Teen Essay Challenge and what it means to you? Um, yeah, so Cambia had reached out to me over a month ago uh, to be involved with this teen essay contest, which had the teens, you know, it's their summer, they put their time into competing in this essay contest and using their words of how they would like to see the world change in terms of racial injustice. Um, obviously, with what's been going on in today's society, it's so important that we do raise these voices of the teens. And for me, it was nice to be able to have that little bit of an impact to help elevate their voices and encourage them for what they have to say and the impact that they can have on us. Um, so I am honored to be a part of this. Um, and I was so inspired and encouraged by all of the submissions that we had had. Agree completely. Um, how do you think your platform has, you know, as a well known athlete, has helped um, or hindered you in sharing your passion um, and certainly in calling out the inequities and the, the need to change? I think as athletes, it's important for us to use our platforms. Um, you know, it, I would say the only in hindrance that I did experience was a personal one of getting out of my own bubble and fear of what people might say. People might be disagreeing with um, my opinion of the injustices or the inequalities in society, but it's so much bigger than that. And so as an athlete, um, we're not only golfers or soccer players or football players, but we're people too. Um, and we do have a very important platform to where our voices can impact society, can impact individuals, and also inspire those to use their voices as well. Um, I think it's great that sport can unify us as a society and as people. And so I think it is important for, you know, my, I'm just one person, but whatever we can do to help incur encourage that unity um, and spread these voices and these positive platforms of hopefully creating change in the future. I agree. I, I was um, really impressed and moved by the essays themselves. And just like you mentioned, I think it can be scary to um, to put yourself out there. Um, and certainly I was impressed that they did with such um, humanity and candor. Um, why do you think it's important to be so authentic in that? Um, I think because again, we are all people. We all are experiencing the highs and lows of life. Um, and so if you can use your authentic voice and connect with people, um, you're not alone and others won't feel like they're alone in whatever they are experiencing. Um, and again, creating that unity of us as people, no matter what you look like or where you come from, but to use that voice um, to speak out against what is wrong um, and what is happening in the world, whether it be um, gender inequalities, racial inequalities. Um, it's just so important to be able to use that and, and elevate those voices to be heard. Agree. And Cheyenne, how about we hear from our amazing winners? So let's hear from Acacia Williams and Kaylee Miner in their own words. 
I am going into 11th grade and I go to Centennial High School. I'm in 10th grade and I go to school at Savage High School. I just hope that I can actually, you know, walk down the street or walk through a store without people like staring or asking questions or trying to get to the bottom of things that really don't need to get to the bottom of. I hope that in the future there's no need for protests, there's no need for rioting by the time by like the time I have children or by the time that my friends have children or adopt or whatever, their kids aren't having to go through what I had to go through growing up and that people don't need to fight this hard just to get the bare minimum of civil civil liberties that they deserve as human beings. I hope that the wide scale of these protests finally um, wakes lo lawmakers up to just kind of the issues that black people face and people of color face day to day because we've kind of been fighting the same fight, I mean, since the beginning of U.S. history, but it's never really been heard and it's never really been acknowledged. And I feel like at this point, we've kind of reached a tipping point. You did not create racism and it shouldn't be on your shoulders to solve. But I thank you for your passion and your commitment on taking on social justice issues to help resolve um, what we're experiencing and facing. Know that you're not alone. We're here to, you know, back you up and you're not in this fight alone, although maybe with the pressure of it all, it may seem sometimes like you're not being heard. But this, I mean, this was to give you that platform and to show you that we are listening to what you are bringing to the table. You know, in the next couple of years, we're gonna be the people that take the helm of all of these things. And so I feel like a lot of people, a lot of teenagers, even though, you know, they shouldn't have to worry about that, are really coming to terms with that fact and instead of just waiting for it to happen, they're trying to push for their own change so that by the time that it's all on them, they don't have that much to worry about. I think a lot of it comes from us having a more global view with growing up with social media and everything, where we get to see things on our own time and make our own opinions about this. And I think we grow up in a society that's much more open to what children think and to what youth sees in the world and so i think this has kind of empowered us to talk more about it to do more about it and i definitely think that the youth are doing all of those things and that we are making a change i was so inspired um, by their insight and their creativity and their voice their authentic voice that they shared with all of us all of us and i learned a lot from their leadership and their inspiration and so just to encourage them to continue to be leaders in our community. And I hope that they keep writing. There are not enough of their voices out there. We are not hearing enough. The field has left them out for too long. And I want them to push and keep those, get those voices out there in whatever way we can. Do something, do anything. You can sign a, you can, you can go to a protest. You can sign some of those things. You can just talk to people, educate yourself. There's so many things that you can do that don't require you to and be in person or to show your face or to get into any sort of trouble that you can do to support both the movement and the future as a whole. For people who look like me, who look like who are black or brown, that this is a problem that affects us from a young age um, and that we grow up surrounded by these issues and that at this point, it is no longer our job and that we all have to fight, however old you are, whatever race you are, for racial equality. Wow. Well, thank you, um, Acacia and Kaylee, for your voice. And thank you, Cheyenne for being one of the judges. Um, I think for all of us judges, and I'd like to thank Tracy Lovert, um, Fiona, I, I'm sure I'm missing a few. It was uh, extremely difficult to narrow down the winners, but I think you heard from Acacia and Kaylee themselves why their voices were so important. Um, for everybody that joined today, you know, we, we put a call out for uh, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of the summer, and we had 26 teens submit entries. Um, and Kaylee and 
Akaisha were selected, um, not only will they receive an iPad, but they are also going to receive, uh, they were also given the opportunity to donate $1,000 to the nonprofit of their choice. And they both independently uh, chose the Black Resilience Fund here in Portland, which supports um, uh, families in need in particular during this COVID crisis. So with that, I just want to thank Cheyenne Woods. I want to thank all of our speakers today. I want to honor and thank Mark Gans uh, for making, uh, it being, being the leader that uh, started this whole uh, uh, Women's Leadership Summit and saw the vision. And as you heard through the years and through uh, the voices of our youth today, we are resilient. We are the future, and uh, we're going to do it. Everybody have a great uh, tour. Please watch Women's Golf. This is being recorded, and um, links will be sent out, especially for those of you that asked any questions, if you'd have access to the video.